I've spent the last few hours researching deeply into soil carbon saturation, and today in this video we'll be going over exactly what I found, including the theoretical limit of soil carbon saturation in a stable form, as well as uh, potential uh, current research that disproves all of that. So this is part of our soil organic carbon course. If you like this video, go check it out on our uh, website, agrosol.com.au. You'll find a whole bunch of other uh, videos and, and course content. We have all the supplementary material that goes with it, so you can find links to the studies I'm talking about in that. Otherwise, you can find the course for free on our YouTube channel. There's a, a playlist full of it, so go check it out completely free. Even on the website, there's no email opt-in, so it's completely free and accessible. So the first idea that we need to get across is mineral associated soil organic carbon. Now this is slightly different to what we've talked about in, in the past, which is humus and the idea of humus as the stable form of soil organic carbon. And we'll have another video in the future talking about the, the problems with humus and how it's a little bit outdated, but stick with it if you're this far into the course. What we want, effectively what we're thinking about is the mineral associated soil organic carbon is a stable part of our soil organic carbon. And, uh, you can more or less relate it to your understanding of humus. So the current understanding is that the mineral associated soil organic carbon is organic carbon that's actually stick, stuck to the mineral or the clay and silt particles in our soil. And so today it's assumed that this organic carbon is actually stable because it's binded to uh, a mineral component, meaning that it's unavailable for the microbes to consume. So with that, there's two uh, components of soil organic carbon. There's the mineral associated component as well as the available or labile component of soil organic carbon, which is available for microbes to actually eat. And so when we think about the dynamics of our um, carbon in our soil, basically we have carbon inputs going into our soil, which is things like cover crops or even our crops, so root extradites going into the soil, as well as litter. So when that plant dies and the biomass becomes available, it goes to the soil surface and then it gets consumed as well as organic amendments. So if you're applying biochar, we have a video on that, um, or composts or um, manures, anything like that, all of that is our carbon input into our soil. Now, part of that is uh, mineralized by our um, biology, by our microbes and released as carbon dioxide. So we have a carbon input, but we also have a carbon output. A part of that is then locked away into a mineral associated soil organic carbon and is considered safe or uh, unavailable for decomposition. So the current understanding is that with increasing soil inputs, we get more or less a tampering off. So we get a rapid increase of our soil organic carbon uh, in our soil, but then it tampers off into a steady state where our microbes break down the carbon input at the same rate as we're putting it into this ground. So we're getting more or less a, a stable uh, state in a soil organic carbon formation as we're losing just as much as we're putting in. Now, this stable state is dependent on a few different factors. Firstly, is temperature dependent as that's gonna regulate our microbial activity. So you'll find soil organic carbon actually accumulates more in uh, colder regions where you get a decrease in microbial activity. So that's one factor, temperature, as well as rainfall, as well as inputs. So the quality of our carbon stock or the carbon inputs, if you have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio, as a good chance that will increase. Likewise, if you have a lower soil, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, that might reduce as the uh, carbon in our soil becomes more available for our microbes to eat. As there's more nitrogen in the soil for our uh, microbes to then consume it with the carbon. So that will affect our steady state. This is made up of both that labile carbon, which is available to our microbes to eat, as well as our uh, mineral associated soil organic carbon. Now the big number that everyone wants is what percentage of the uh, clay and silt particle can be saturated with soil organic carbon. And it seems like 8% of the clay and silt percentage is available um, for that organic matter to stick to the clay. Now this is based off previous research. So this is kind of stuff in the past that's more or less thought of as uh, the current understanding, but we'll get to what the go is later. So 8% of, of our clay and silt particle seems to be the saturation point of uh, our soils to hold soil organic carbon, which means the higher your clay content or your silt content, uh, the higher amount of stable carbon you can hold. So if you've got 10% clay and silt, you can only hold 0.8% mineral associated soil organic carbon. Now, the other component is that 
this is a stable part just because we have we can only hold 0.8% doesn't necessarily mean we can't have more it's just going to be in that labile stage uh, which is available for our microbes to eat and then reproduce carbon dioxide which is not a bad thing cycling is quite important um, it's you get this fertilizing effect so it's not a bad thing very important um, but if you think about so uh, carbon capture in our soil is kind of where we want to be. On the other hand, if this, if these two states are equal, we're having equal amount of carbon uh, input to carbon output, we get increased to this point and effectively sequester carbon. Um, but anyways, so as we increase up to even higher and higher amounts of clay and soil content, we can increase our mineral associated soil organic carbon to say 7.2% at a 80% clay and soil content. Now in Australia, we don't really have much silt. So really we're just looking at clay soils. So whether or not you have a clay soil versus a sandy soil, um, you can look at your soil uh, tests at home to determine your potential uh, mineral associated organic carbon uh, can be. Otherwise you can do a ribbon test to roughly determine your own texture, which you get this. So this is one component of storing soil organic carbon, which is actually how much soil organic carbon can we pack into per unit of soil. And it's important when we're considering uh, carbon sequestration in the upper profile because that usually gets saturated first um, and is typically higher. But what we have kind of talked about in this whole series of um, soil organic carbon building is that most of our soil organic carbon sequestration happens in our subsoil. So when we have roots that go deep into our soil, the one idea that I resonate with and is that we have a unlimited ability to sequester the soil organic carbon as we get deeper into our soil profile and we're getting this soil building effect. And so yes we might be able to saturate the top soil with a decomposition pathway and if you want check that video out but there's almost an unlimited capacity to build soil organic carbon deeper and deeper into the soil into the soil profile assuming you don't hit um, your, your sea horizon or your uh, parent material. And you can more or less see that in this photo here of Colin Sice's property with pasture cropping. Compared to his neighbour, you get soil organic carbon moving deeper and deeper down into the into the soil horizon. So does it doesn't really matter if we max out the top layer if we have all this ability to sequester the carbon deeper and deeper into the soil? Um, maybe. So there's those two components. We are limited by the actual soil organic carbon we can produce or fix into a particular area, which you can, as a rule of thumb, say 8% of the clay and silt content of the soil, but also our depth. So, so you're limited by the depth of your roots. So if you can increase your, or improve your soil um, structure and uh, airflow into the deeper parts of the soil, you can do that with cover crops and uh, better um, uh, microbial management. The more you can sequester carbon lower into your soil. So before we get into kind of the current understanding, we're limited by our carbon inputs, which is more or less uh, dependent on our rainfall and temperature. So in really tropical areas, we can increase our uh, carbon biomass or our biomass production from our plants as well as our root extradites. Now, with increased rainfall and temperature, we also get an increase in mineralization rate from our microbes. So it probably more or less uh, balances each other out, out, which is so our carbon output, which is also dependent, as I said, on rainfall and temperature, Limitation, we're limited by our uh, clay and silt content and our types of clay. So some clays are better at holding um, our mineral associated organic carbon and some are worse. But this is where things get tricky. So when we consider all of that, that only actually explains 61% of our soil organic carbon. And this was found in a, a recent study, uh, 2023, called uh, No Detectable Upper Limits of Mineral Associated Organic Carbon in Temperate agricultural soils. So they looked at over 150 different soils, um, plotted them in terms of their uh, fine coarse fragments, so everything but sand, uh, and the mineral associated soil organic carbon, and more or less, these are the, re the results. They found that although there's more or less a 21% correlation between our fine uh, fragment in our soil and our mineral associated carbon, there seems to be all these outliers, so there's higher there's higher points where previously it seemed to be oversaturation of our um, of our clay and silt particles and sections where it's under saturated. So the question is, how can some of these soils have heaps of mineral associated soil organic carbon 
uh, but theoretically they really shouldn't or everything else tends to be uh, more and more around this line. As I said, the clay and silt percentage only explains 21% of the variation in um, the data. And likewise, these inputs only explain 61% of this organic carbon. So there's all these other factors that explain the variation in the mineral associated organic carbon. And so the study goes on to explain how there's potentially no upper limit to the amount of uh, organic matter we can fix onto uh, the mineral component of our soil. And so they gave the analogy of almost a settlement where you have, uh, say, a small island, which represents the uh, a soil with a small amount of clay and silt. And so the settlement uh, analogy is like this. On a small island, you can have almost like a mega city on that small island. And once the space fills up, so we fill up that space with the available space on the clay and silt particles. Now, this was thought to be, uh, that's it. Like once, once you fill up all the space or the surface area, you can't sequester any more carbon. Um, it's maxed out. But what they found, or what they're suggesting, is that there's actually, you can more or less stack soil organic carbon on soil organic carbon on your minerals. And so, which is where that mega city idea comes in. So you can then get these non-uniform bits of soil organic carbon onto uh, your particles. So this seems to be the oversaturation that we're kind of finding. Likewise, in a area where you have a lot more surface area like this, you might have uh, what seems to be less soil organic carbon per unit of clay and silt. Um, but the idea is why can't you oversaturate these particles with say this mega city idea, but on a larger um, area. So there you have it. There might not be a upper limit on how much soil organic carbon we can sequester. It might take more and more effort as more uh, mineralizes and is released into um, the atmosphere or back into the plants and then sequester it. Um, but overall as farmers, this shouldn't really uh, affect us too much. Like if we're doing all the things that are gonna improve our soil anyways, soil organic carbon is just a byproduct of that. Uh, and the more we can sequester and improve our soils, the better. And as I talked about with the technique that's that we've talked about before in the liquid carbon pathway, we're trying to sequester carbon deep into the soil profile. So this idea, yes, it's important for the top parts of the top soil um, with the decomposition pathway. It shouldn't really matter too much as we're trying to sequester carbon deep into the soil profile with living roots. So if you're confused about that, so am I. There's a good chance that future research will disprove all of this, uh, but this is more or less the current understanding. So if you have any input, please put it down in the comments. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for watching. Cheers. Bye.